Welcome back to the sessions on e sectioner on the course transmission and distribution. This is Dr. Umar Rao, a retired professor from RV College of Engineering, Bengaluru. So, in the previous session, we saw about how DC systems again came back and HVDC became popular. And why HVDC became popular, we also saw primarily because it was more economical over longer distances and it was now feasible to convert AC to DC and DC to AC because of the power electronic technology. And HVDC was very useful to transmit power over water bodies. However, there is no technology without its own drawbacks. So, let us see what are the drawbacks of HVDC systems. The first is the cost of the converters. So, you need an inverter at one end and a rectifier at the other end and these are very expensive. And often the cost of the converters does not offset the other advantages you get by HVDC transmission. Secondly, in case of AC, it is very easy to draw parallel lines, but multi-terminal DC systems are more complex to design. The converter station substations require reactive power and they also generate harmonics because we know that any power electronic equipment or device when switched, it causes harmonics. So, these harmonics are harmful in the grid and the converters have to be installed with filters. And the high frequency components because of this harmonics can cause a lot of radio and communication interference in lines situated close to the HVDC lines. So, these are some of the major disadvantages of HVDC systems. Secondly, the grounding is also complex and difficult and very, very important. And the flow of current in a monopole where the ground is used as a return path can cause lot of erosion in underground metal installations such as water pipelines and other pipes which are there underground. Now, if you see this graph here, so this is the distance of transmission This is the distance of transmission and the y axis is the costs. Okay. So, if you see the AC line, AC is here right and DC is here, they intersect at this point. So, this is roughly around 600 kilometers. So, less than 600 kilometers, you can see that the AC lines are cheaper, we are talking of transmission and more than 600 kilometers, DC lines become cheaper. So, what happens at larger distances, the cost advantage by using HVDC offsets the other costs of HVDC. So, wherever the transmission is more than 600 kilometers, HVDC transmission provides a viable alternative to AC transmission. So, we saw about the transmission, the general transmission. Now, let us see what are the main components of a distribution system. So, you have a distribution substation where the voltage is stepped down to the level required by the consumer. Then you have a distribution feeder, primary distribution feeder and then you have distribution transformers. So, I think all of you while walking on the road, you would have found some transformers. So, they step down at the consumer level the distribution transformer gives you the voltage required by your equipment. Then we have distributors and service mains. So, let us see what these components are. So, the distribution substation. So, basically it is meant to step down to step down the transmission voltages. Okay. So, you may step it down to 33 kV or 6.6 kV or 11 kV, whatever is required. 
and it operates at a lower voltage levels and delivers electric energy this is important directly to industrial and residential consumers ok. So, you can see I have a substation you can just see here I have a substation and from here it may go to other substations which may step it down further ok and then you can connect at the this is your distribution feeder and you can connect to the loads. So, here are your distribution transformers. So, you see the voltage is stepped down at different levels. So, this could be other substation or a consumer like an industry can tap the voltage can take the power at a higher voltage of say 66 kV, 33 kV and these local distribution transformers will step it down to the lowest level as required by the residential customers right. Next we have the feeders. So, feeders and distributors are both conductors. So, it connects what does a feeder do? The feeder connects the distribution substation to the area where the power is to be distributed. So, the substation you would not have in every locality right. So, from the substation it will take to different localities. So, the line which takes from the substation to a particular local area is called as a feeder. So, normally tappings are not taken there you do not have tappings in between it is a line it is a single line which goes to the local center. Now, since there is no tapping in between the current through the distributor will be the same. So, if I connect loads in between what happens these loads will draw currents and so the current in different sections will be different. So, in a feeder normally a feeder is a conductor which carries the power from the distribution substation to the local area from where it is further distributed to the different consumers. So, what is the main point you have to consider here is the current carrying capacity is called as the ampacity because the current is amperes, current is in amperes. So, what is the ampacity of the feeder that is the most important when you design the feeder. You can call it as the primary distribution line, primary distribution line. It is like wholesale and retail ok. Distributor is the line where tappings are taken and given to the local customers. As I told you, you can think of the feeder as a wholesale supplier from a main source the wholesaler gets it and you can think of the distributor as a retail. So, from the wholesale different retails they go and the retailer gives it to many consumers something like that. So, in a distributor that is also a conductor right. So, the power is given to different consumers. So, you have tappings in between you would have seen no from a pole you take a pole right and from your local small substation you have a small line there is a pole and from that pole some 10 consumers are given 10 houses are given supply and then from there the line continues to the next pole and there another 10, 20 or 30 customers are given. So, you see there are tappings in between there are tappings in between that is the primary difference between a distributor and a feeder. A feeder has no tappings and the distributor has tappings. So, once it comes to distributors we have some standard options available. So, you see here this is a distributor line this is a distributor line and so from here different consumers are taken. This is called as a radial feed radial distributor straight simple and very cheap ok and CB stands for circuit breaker all of you would have seen your circuit breakers at home. So, whenever there is a fault the breaker will trip and cut off the supply to your house. So, your equipment will be safe the same thing it is only a higher rating ok. So, this could be you know uh, uh, maybe 10 roads here supplying a few customers and this could be another 10 customers being fed and so on ok. So, the problem here is you see supposing a fault occurs here a fault occurs here and this breaker somewhere you have a breaker it opens the fault will the entire thing will be cut off. 
because this breaker will operate and all the customers may be cut off. So, this is one of the issues with distribution transformers that are radial point to point. Okay. Next you have parallel distributors. So, you see what I have? I have a substation, a transmission this is at 66 kV. Then I have step down transformers stepping down maybe to 22, 11 or 6.6 .6 kV. And then you see I have one typically a large industrial customer and so on. So, here there is a switch, you can see there is a switch. Okay. So, these two will be now in parallel, these two are in parallel. Supposing there is a fault in one of the regions, right? I close this switch, I close this switch and say supposing this breaker has opened, this breaker has opened, okay. so this breaker has opened. So, at that time I close this switch. So, now what will happen? These two areas will get supply from here because this switch is closed. These two areas will get supply from here because this switch is closed. Can you see? So, the advantage with parallel distributors is this is a very simple, very simple representation is that if there is a fault somewhere, you can close some switches and see that there is an alternate path to supply the load. Therefore, reliability is better and today we have a lot of critical load centers like data centers and uh, you know hospitals where you need to have power all the time which cannot have power interrupted. So, today if you see in the hospitals there is so much of electrical and electronic equipment a power disruption could be fatal for so many people. So, in such cases parallel feeders are very very useful. An improvement on that is a ring main. So, what is done here is the distributor is arranged in the form of a closed loop. See, this is the distributor, it is arranged, this is called as the ring, this is called as the ring and this is a substation, this is a substation and you have a closed ring. So, you see if there is a fault here and this section is cut off, still power can flow like this. So, once you are in a loop, you can ensure that there are alternate paths for the power to flow. Okay. So, in a ring main, you form a closed loop, that is why it is called as a ring. So, the distributor starts at one end, now normally the substation and comes back to the substation around a loop and in between the power is drawn. So, wherever a fault occurs, there is always a path for the load, there is always a path for the load, it is never completely cut off. You can also have here a substation feeding the ring at from two ends. Then we say it is a mesh system, there is more than one source. A ring system is one what I have shown here, there is one substation. If you have one more substation feeding the ring, you can call it as a meshed system. So, the reliability improves from radial, parallel is better and ring main is even better. Now, if fault occurs at any point on the ring, the faulty section may be isolated by circuit breakers. In modern power systems, the isolation and restoration, you can do it by a centrally controlled supervisory system. Okay? So, we have a lot of automation today in the distribution sector and a number of breakers, relays, protection equipment, everything can be controlled, energization of transformers, all can be controlled from a local central point. So, you see this is another example like how, how you can distribute. So, I have a, say a primary distribution center, then CB stands for breakers, then you have the zone substations where you are going to step down at one more level and industries can tap anywhere and let us say this breaker opens, this breaker opens. Okay. So, if this breaker opens, this path is cut off, but I, I still have a path through the other breakers. So, you see how the reliability of the system is improved. So, you can see that if the breakers are open partially in part of the network, then you can still maintain the power flow to the part where 
the breaker is open through an alternate path. Okay. Next we have the service mains. What is the service? So, you saw what is a feeder? A feeder is from the substation to the local area without any tappings. A distributor in the local area it takes to individual loads. So, there will be tappings in between. You can have a radial, you can have a parallel, you can have a ring distributor. Next is the service mains. The service main is a cable connected between the distributor and the consumer terminal. So, actually what comes from your pole, you know, you can say that is your service main, see here. So, this is the distribution transformer and these are the lines and here this brings to your doorstep. So, this is called as the service main. Clear? All are conductors, all are conductors. Then we have something called as interconnectors useful largely in ring main systems. So, what happens in ring main you have a loop, you have a loop okay? and if this loop is very big the path taken for the power flow would be long. So, if the path is long then the voltage drop would be more. So, where the ring is complex sometimes what is done a shorter path is provided by connecting an interconnector, this is an interconnector this is an interconnector. Okay. So, a shorter path is provided by connecting an interconnector. So, now we have some idea about the distribution system, the feeder, the distribution, the service main and the interconnector. So, we have satisfied our objectives of knowing about EHVAC, ultra high AC, HVDC, why they are preferred, what are their advantages, disadvantages. Now, let us move on to the next set of learning objectives. What are the supporting structures and what are the different types of conductors used? Aluminium, copper, then super resistant and uh, gap type super thermal aluminium alloy conductors and so on. So, we will study all this in the following session. Now, you see this, you have overhead lines and underground cables. So, overhead lines is what you normally see, right? You can see these lines, everywhere we see them, overhead lines. So, an overhead line is a bare conductor, just a conductor which is carrying current. You touch it and you are grounded, you will get a shock. And an underground cable is what you know the cables you see, the cables you see. So, what happens in an underground cable is the conductor is insulated, the conductor is insulated. I am sure you have all seen cables. So, in an underground cable, it is a transmission or a distribution cable and it is under the ground, the name itself is telling you, it is placed under the ground. So, the power is transported through cables which are laid under the ground. Okay. So, this Im image is taken from the following source, it is a nice image to show you. So, let us just quickly see what are the overhead lines. So, there are uninsulated electric conductors suspended by towers or poles, all of us have seen transmission towers. So, as you go through the countryside you will find huge towers, steel, steel towers. And from the towers you will see some lines going, conductors going, we have all seen that. And poles, poles are visible everywhere, you have seen concrete poles and I am sure in the village side some of you might have seen wooden poles. Okay. So, overhead lines are the lowest cost, cheaper method of transmission for large quantities of electric power. So, our bulk power transfer across the world takes place through overhead conductors the conductor is exposed to the atmosphere, there is no covering over it. So, if rain falls, rain falls on the conductor, if there is no snow falls on the conductor. So, the conductor is exposed in case of to the weather in case of overhead conductors. It requires minimum clearances to maintain safety. So, it should be above the tallest building in the area and so on, there are some clearances to be maintained. And 
wind can cause oscillatory motions of the physical line called as galloping. That means the lines will start moving up and down, up and down. That is called as galloping. And again you need a minimum clearance because two lines may just collide. I have two lines, both start vibrating in the wind, then they may touch each other and you may have a short circuit. So, I need a minimum clearance to account for the galloping. So, we always have to maintain adequate clearances between energized conductors and the ground. So, this clearance is dependent on the voltage, what voltage you are using transfer transmission. Now, what are underground cables they run under the ground name itself tells you. So, since it is under the ground it is not exposed and because of the insulation and the dielectric used inside the reactive power of the cable capacitance is very high. Okay, the dielectric inside causes a very high capacitance and therefore, it would be very difficult to provide insulation at higher voltages for the cable and the installation cost would be very high. Moreover, this capacitance of the line of the, there is the underground cable the conductor will draw current which can cause lot of heating in the cable and therefore, underground cables are restricted in the length of transmission. So, we saw in the previous session transmission lines over 2000 kilometers we cannot do that with underground cables. So, let us quickly see the key differences between overhead lines and underground cables. The first is the initial cost. The initial cost of underground transmission lines is more you have to trench you cannot just put the cable down no you have to cut proper trenches the cable laying process the manholes I have to provide manholes for people to go inside and check if there is a fault and it, it is around 3 to 10 times higher depending on the voltage level and the cost local labor cost etcetera than overhead transmission systems. Second, the overhead lines are visible, the overhead lines are visible and they are dangerous because there is always a chance that animals may come in contact with them and underground cables are below the ground. So, animals on the ground will be safe, there is no chance that they will go and touch a uh, touch an underground cable. Now, generally underground cables the fault occurrence is less and the occurrence of fault in overhead systems is high because it is exposed to the weather. So, you will have lightning striking, wind, thunderstorms, snow, ice. So, all this will cause lot of issues with overhead cables sorry overhead lines. The visual appearance so, today we are all very bothered about aesthetic. So, we do not like to see lines we say it spoils the beauty of the city. So, people prefer underground especially in residential areas and where there are commercial establishments like shops etcetera underground is preferred from aesthetic conditions. Okay. Now, though the underground cables the fault is lesser it is very difficult to locate the fault because it is under the ground. So, a lot of effort is required though we do have very sophisticated technologies today by using lasers etcetera you can locate the fault, but overhead lines it is much because it is exposed and it is much easier to know where the fault has occurred. Similarly, the repair is much easier in overhead lines than in underground cables. The current carrying capacity of overhead lines is very good. And I told you underground cables there is lot of heating because of the high capacitance and therefore, the power that can be transported is limited. And underground cables have a life of around 40 to 50 years whereas, overhead cables have a very long life. Underground cables mainly because of the insulation, so it deteriorates with age. So, these are some of the key differences of overhead lines and underground. Uh, cables and underground cables have no problem of interference because they are under the ground whereas, overhead lines even in the previous session I told you that with extra high voltage and ultra high voltage you have lot of issues of communication interference. And power restoration 
is faster with overhead. You can understand why because I see it. I can immediately send linemen or manual labor to see where the fault is and rectify it. Whereas underground cable, once a fault occurs, it takes a longer time to restore. So we will move on with these key differences. Now again, we have a very nice video of a company, a distribution company which is deciding whether to go in for underground or overhead transmission lines. So the experience and debate of this company is presented in this YouTube video and let us all acknowledge our gratitude to YouTube for making it available to us. I guess that video told you a lot of things, you know. So how the companies debate on what to go with, whether they have to go with underground or overhead and what are some of the issues they think about before coming to a decision. So now let us see what are the components of overhead systems. Very easy, I need to know the conductor, what type of conductor to use, how to support it and what insulators to be used and there is something called as cross arms, we will see what it is and some auxiliary protection like lightning arresters, etc. So the supporting structures, the name itself is telling you what we are talking of. What is the civil structure required to house and hold these transmission lines, overhead transmission lines? These are called as the supporting structures. They provide the necessary spacing between the conductors and also between the conductor and the ground. So you have seen no transmission towers, the conductors will be at a high height, a height much much above the ground level and two lines do not go close by, there is a clearance between the two lines. So the structure has to be designed to adhere to all these standards. What do you expect out of a mechanical structure? First it should have a very good safety factor, safety factor means we have in many engineering designs, we have what is called as a safety factor. It is like a balance. So what I do, you know, for an emergency, if you require say 10,000 rupees to be on the safer side, you will have 20,000 rupees. It is like that, that is the meaning of a safety factor. So if X is sufficient, if X is sufficient, but my system is very critical, then I am going to have 2X or 3X or 5X. That is excess, in excess, okay. So if a tower has to bear some weight, then I will design the tower to bear three times that weight so that nothing wrong can happen. That is the meaning of factor of safety. So the key feature of the supporting structure one is the factor of safety and obviously we want it to be cheap and have a low maintenance and it should be available for erection of the line conductors. So the line supports are normally made of wood, concrete, steel or aluminium. So two main structures are used, one is the electric pole and other is the electric tower. So you can see the poles, poles all of us have seen. A pole which supports transmission lines not more than 115 kV voltages is an electrical pole. It can be made of wood, concrete or steel, depends on the cost, atmosphere and line voltage. Concrete poles are quite popular and wooden poles is what you see here like this. So this, this is the pole, the pole is made of wood and these are the insulators, these are the insulators. Now you obviously have an issue. Uh, issue with the wooden poles, they are normally used for short distances and uh, used in rural areas where wood is easily available and the wood also provides insulation and has lesser chances of uh, flashover. But then the problem is wood deteriorates, it is exposed, na? 
once you erect a pole it is exposed to the atmosphere and so it deteriorates fast and has a low lifespan of around 20 years and their mechanical strength is also low the mechanical strength of the wooden poles are also low so what is the alternative i have i have steel poles we have all seen this steel poles okay so again these are insulators these are insulators and these are the distribution lines or transmission lines sub trans you know at 33 kV whatever now what is the advantage of steel they are used for medium and low voltages longer lifespan because you, you know you can easily protect it from weather effects of the weather by galvanizing so once you galvanize the steel you can prevent corrosion and steel is a conductor mind you unlike wood so you have to properly earth the poles and their maintenance expense is high but their lifespan is more the reliability is more next we have concrete poles this also we have seen in india in many places we have concrete poles so the structure is made from concrete they are heavy concrete is very heavy and transportation cost is high and they are very durable more durable than steel and uh, they do not have much degradation under adverse weather conditions the maintenance cost is also low and they are mechanically very strong so you will find a number of concrete poles and wooden poles are more or less phased out across the globe next we come to towers so all of us have seen different tower structures i have put some pictures we have all seen this so the electric poles are supports at the lower voltage and for higher voltages steel towers are used they are mechanically very strong and durable and their design itself is a big uh, aspect the design of the towers they are used for long spans long spans so you saw transmission over 500 kilometers 200 kilometers 1000 kilometers and so on obviously we have steel towers and so the tower also has to be solidly grounded okay the foot of the tower the base the base of the tower etc has to be solidly grounded and the tower can also act as a lightning arrester because it can provide a conducting path for the lightning and improve the reliability of the system they are very useful and very very widely used briefly that is all you need to know briefly what are the different alternatives you have for uh, providing supports for the transmission systems so now let us come to conductors so here we have a wide variety a wide variety of uh, materials available for building the conductors copper was the first metal used we all know copper as a conductor for electrical power so the first systems they did use copper 1880s and so on they are very expensive copper is very very expensive slowly what happened aluminium started replacing copper so we had earlier systems with aluminium so see you saw within a span of about 15 years 1880 we had copper 1895 1880 why copper was used because the distances were short we saw the first line was 1.5 kilometers then 14 kilometers so for short distances copper was fine but then once you want longer distances copper became extremely expensive and immediately aluminium took over it completely replaced copper almost more or less completely replaced copper by 1900 or so for overhead transmission now what is the advantage of aluminium it is cheap lightweight but its conductivity is less than copper right so you have a larger diameter for the same amount of current because the conductivity is lesser this is in, in a way good because a larger diameter will reduce the effect of corona so that was another advantage of aluminium now today we have a lot of improvements over plain copper and uh, aluminium and the proper 
choice of the conductor is very important for transmission and distribution. So, you can have solid wires, one wire that is called as a solid wire completely or I can have some sort of a hollow conductor with something inside reinforcing or I can have stranded, stranded conductors. So, you can just see at home if your iron box breaks, you can see there will be stranded wires. So, we can have stranded wires. So, you have a different variety of conductors available today. So, solid wires are used for smaller cross section and you they have a lower current carrying capacity. Now, anyway we know that in AC systems we have the skin effect. So, that means the current tends to remain at the surface of the conductor, okay, it does not reach the depth of the conductor. So, for higher currents we require larger cross section and this would reduce the mechanical stability if solid wires are used, they become heavy. So, they will tend to sag. So, in such cases we can use stranded conductors. So, you will have one conductor and a number of strands around it. So, if you know the diameter, if you know the diameter of one strand okay, and if you have n strands then you can calculate the effective outer diameter of the stranded conductor. So, when I have so many choices how do I choose a conductor? So, what are the factors which reflect my choice of the conductor? So, mainly it is the current carrying capacity or what we call as a thermal performance. So, as current flows through the conductor what happens it gets heated up. So, does it get heated up so much that it will start melting right. So, I have to be careful about the choice of the conductor. The other is the cost tensile strength, if there is a wind what if this conductor snaps or it sags just that is called as the tensile strength. Is it strong enough to withstand the stresses, mechanical stresses? Okay. So, these are all some of the issues which are important and which determine the choice of the material we use for the conductor. So, let us quickly see what are all the various materials that are used today. First, I have copper. It was earlier used in overhead lines, has very high conductivity, good current density, good tensile strength, everything. Area of cross section is small, all beautiful, but for large powers, large currents it becomes very expensive and you have uh, increased corona because the diameter is small. And copper also is not available so much that you can use copper for all your overhead lines. So, aluminum is one of the best choices widely used for overhead lines. So, its conductivity is less approximately around 60 percent of uh, copper. So, therefore, for the same rating current rating you would need a higher diameter, you would need a higher diameter. This is an advantage because the higher diameter will actually reduce the corona effect and but you require towers of greater height and it has a high coefficient of expansion but a low tensile strength. So, more prone to sag, what is the meaning of sag? Dip, I have a wire that is a conductor and if there is a wind falling on it or ice falling on it, it will sag, it will form you know it will dip. So, that is one of the effects of using aluminum because it has got a low tensile strength compared to copper. Its specific weight is much lower than copper making it lighter. So, greater swings in the conductors at the same time reducing the weight of the supporting structures. So, you see both of them have some advantages, some disadvantages, it is a trade off and eventually aluminum won aluminum one in the race. So, what do I do is instead of using pure aluminum we have some alloys. So, that some of the disadvantages of you know like a low tensile strength for example, I can improve on it. 
at the same time it does not become as expensive as copper and availability is more. So, we have what is called as all aluminum conductor and this is also called as ASC aluminum stranded conductor. So, what is done here? It is made up of one or more strands of hard drawn aluminum alloy. So, an aluminum alloy is around 99.5 percent aluminum content and a small addition of other elements like silicon, iron, copper, manganese and other elements. So, almost pure aluminum ok very high percentage of aluminum and a very small percentage of some other material. So, it can be used in medium high and low voltages a you can use and its strength to weight ratio is not still very good and they are not used on a large scale in transmission lines and rural distribution where large spans are required 1000 kilometers and so on if you want to run it is not a very good choice. It is a good choice in coastal areas because of the good resistance corrosion resistance of aluminum. And this small bit of alloy will improve the conductivity as compared to pure aluminum and therefore, can be used for shorter spans in urban area. So, current carrying capacity is higher because of the alloy, it is corrosion resistance, a good choice in coastal areas and appropriate for low and medium voltage lines. This is a summary of what we discussed. Next we have all aluminum alloys conductors triple AC. This is similar to all aluminum conductors except the alloy. So, the alloy used is a high aluminum magnesium silicon alloy. So, this is more expensive, but it can be designed to have better strength to weight ratio when just compared to all aluminum conductors. So, it has improved electrical properties and reduced sag, the sag is lesser than using pure aluminum. So, you can use it for longer spans. So, you can use it for medium and high voltage lines. So, next we have aluminum conductor steel reinforced the name itself is telling you what it is. You have aluminum conductor and it is reinforced using steel why steel has very good tensile strength. So, it is made up of one or more layers of hard drawn aluminum wire on a steel wire. The steel wires are galvanized to minimize corrosion. They are light white because the entire wire is not steel only the reinforcement is steel and the rest is aluminum and because of the tensile strength of the steel reinforcement the sag is reduced and they have good conductivity because you are after all using aluminum. So, it can be used for longer spans. The steel is the one which provides tensile strength and aluminum carries most of the current it is on the surface most of the current flows on the surface. So, aluminum carries the current. Thus, they have the added advantage of high tensile strength, good current carrying capacity, lesser sag and reduction in losses due to larger diameter of the conductors. So, you see we have a wide range. So, you see this is how it looks you have a steel reinforcement you can see here it is very clear you have a steel reinforcement and you have the aluminum strands around. And most of the conductor will be carried by the aluminum current sorry most of the current will be carried by the aluminum. So, it has good conductivity and this steel will give it good strength. So, the sag is reduced a very nice material and very very commonly used. Then we have aluminum conductor alloy reinforced similar to the steel reinforcement except that the reinforcement is by an uh, aluminum over magnesium silicon alloy. So, it has better properties than all the three we discussed previously and has a very good balance between mechanical and electrical properties and extensively used in overhead transmission and distribution systems. So, you see this is how it is ok. So, this is the alloy alloy wire which gives you the reinforcement this and you have the outer aluminum wire. 
Next we have what are called as high temperature conductors or they are called as high temperature low sag HTLS high temperature low sag. These conductors are now slowly replacing the other types because they have a higher current carrying capacity, lower sag, easy and rapid installation, long term reliability and low line loss. Then you have thermal resistance aluminum alloy. It is similar in construction to the aluminum reinforced conductor. It is made of galvanized steel and thermal resistance aluminum alloy. They are operated normally at 150 de degrees centigrade and above. So, very very useful at very high temperatures where you know the ambient temperature is of the geography is very high or the current is very high. We need thermal resistant conductor material and these are specially used for such cases. So, when do I need this? I told you when the ambient temperature is high, but ambient temperature will not be as high as 150 degrees centigrade mainly for bulk power high power transmission. We use this and the electrical and mechanical properties are maintained at high temperatures because of the presence of zirconium doped aluminum alloy that is the one which gives it the that zirconium is the one which gives it the thermal resistance. Since the conductors are operated at high temperatures, they have high current carrying capacity and are economical. Okay. So, you see then you have super thermal resistance aluminum alloy, they are called as ZTAI thermal resistance aluminum alloys. These are made of aluminum mixed with a small amount of zirconium and you can operate it at around 200 degree centigrade or above. So, Allowable current is two times that of pure aluminum and used when the power to be transmitted is really really high. Okay. And we have one more in this the GZTACSR. So, these conductors have a special construction feature with a small gap filled with grease between the steel core and the thermal resistance aluminum zirconium alloy. Why do I use a grease here? The grease will avoid the friction between the steel core and the aluminum alloy you can see here. There is a gap here. Okay. So, you have the galvanized steel in the front and you have a small gap and then you have the aluminum alloy and this is filled with grease. So, this will prevent the friction this will prevent the friction and these are also used at very high temperatures of 200 degree centigrade or more and they are very economical because it is not very expensive not very expensive materials. Lastly we have what are called as bundled conductors where you have more than one conductor in each phase. So, we will see more in detail about the bundle conductors in the next session. So, we will end this session and just recap that we have seen a wide range of conductors available and a proper choice of the material has to be done based on the power to be transmitted, the temperature which it has to withstand, the cost, the sag permitted, the clearances required and make a judicious selection of the material to be used. So, let us start the next session with the bundle conductors and go more in detail. Thank you.